Turn to John 4, 24, and the Bible said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As I said last week, we have no idea what a spirit being is because we do not know the essence of a spirit. All we can do is use similes, wind, air, and so forth, to uh, try to understand it in the sense that we understand things. But there's no way we know. We'll only know when God manifests himself to us. But the classes we talked about last week of the spirit world, first of all, God is at the very top, and then angels, and then spirit beings like cherubim, seraphim, principalities and powers, then man is a, is, uh, has a spirit. Uh, and the Bible says that the, that the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, and that's the part that God communicates with. And in the New Testament, he's a born-again spirit. Demons... Don't worry, the word doesn't show up in the New Testament in English, but it is in Greek, and it is a spirit being, and we'll get all that later before we find, <clears throat> we find ghosts, familiar spirits, and all the rest of them that are associated with the demonic. And let me say this, the demonic world is a very large world, very large. I got into more detail. We talked about the Father being a spirit being, the Son is a spirit being, and the Holy Spirit is a spirit being. And the Son, of course, is God manifest in flesh. Amen. God became a man and dwelt among us. And one way to understand the uh, unity of the Godhead is that all things are of the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, then, therefore, it fits into what's called the mystery of the Godhead, then there are the angels. They fall in the category of archangels, angels, fallen angels, the angel of the Lord, and then our angel, talking about us individually as, uh, as a person. When I gave the illustration of Peter when he showed up at the door, and Rhoda went, to, went to, the, to the door and saw him and, and said, he's here at the door to the people inside waiting. And they said, that's not him, it's his angel. So uh, that opens up... Uh, a line of study. We'll get to that later. Spirit beings, cherubim, seraphim. And the book of Daniel talks about watchers and uh, principalities and powers mentioned in the New Testament. And then man. Man is a unique creature. There's nothing else like him. We're not angels. We're not cherubim. We're not seraphim. Although these creatures may appear as men, they are not men. A man is a unique thing. A man was made from the dust of the ground. God breathed into that body the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, concept of man is not exactly the same. And the reason for that is because man has changed between the Old Testament and the New. For example, the Old Testament talks about the body of a man, talks about the spirit of a man, it talks about the soul of a man. The New Testament talks about the body of a man. It talks about the spirit of a man and the soul of a man. The Greek word used in the New Testament for the soul of a man is a uh, suke. In the New Testament, the word for spirit is pneuma. And the New Testament, the word for a man's body is soma. This is where you get the term psychosomatic. It originates in the spirit, but it affects the body. See, And there originates suke with the soul and affects the body. And so it's a psychosomatic illness. They, they like to use big terms. Is there a difference, therefore, between the Bible concept of an Old Testament man and a New Testament man? Absolutely. And that's important to understand because it will help you greatly in understanding how the Bible deals with men and how it describes us from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And let me give you some of the words, for example, translated uh, one word. I'm going to give you that word nephesh. How many of you have ever heard the word nephesh? Nephesh is very common in the Old Testament. And the word nephesh is commonly translated soul in the Old Testament of a man. Now carefully, the body in the Old Testament can be translated from the Hebrew word nephesh or esem or other words. That means the body of the individual. The soul of a man in the Old Testament is ruach. And that can be, or, or is nephesh rather. The soul of a man in the Old Testament is nephesh. And that Hebrew word nephesh is translated soul, but not always soul. And then spirit in the Old Testament is ruach, and that has to do with man's spirit. Now, I don't want to confuse you this morning, but it's important, very important, that the Old Testament does not make a clear distinction many times between the body 
and the soul. Let me show you how Numa, not Numa, but Nefesh is translated. It's translated as any, appetite, beast, body, breath, creature, dead, dead body, desire, fish, ghost, heart, hearty, herself, himself, life, lust, man, mind, mortally, myself, one, own, person, pleasure, soul, thing, themselves, thyself, will, would have it, yourselves, so forth and so on. Do you see this? Do you see the vast spectrum that that one word, nephesh, is translated into all these other words? It's not like that in the New Testament when it comes to the word pneuma that has to do with the spirit and, uh, and, 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 the, and the word for the uh, suke for the word for the soul. You don't have all this vast difference of meaning. Say, so why do you have that, preacher? Because in the Old Testament, the soul and the body, most of the time, were spoken of synonymously, referring to the same thing. Why? Because they were stuck together in the Old Testament, unlike the New Testament. In Colossians chapter number 2, he said plainly that you've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body. But that could not happen until you were born again. Amen born of the Spirit of God. Now, I'm just flying through this because there's so much more material I want to cover. But I'm what I'm trying to do is just lay something out for you to make you think about the vast difference between the Old Testament concept of a human being and the New Testament concept of a human being. The New Testament gets into far more detail when it deals with the human aspect of what we are. The words translated, for example, flesh in the New Testament are different with nuances of meaning. Some of them have the flesh have to do with the body. Some of the flesh have to do with the mind. You know, all of these things in the New Testament, the reason for that is because the individual in the New Testament now has become a tripart being like God if he's born again. And so the Bible deals with all of that. Then when we come to demons, I want to talk about them this morning for a little while. A demon in the Bible is an unclean spirit. As I told you last week, the old ancient Greeks like uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Maximander, and the rest of them, the golden age of Greece, they desired a demon because to them a demon was a thing to have. It represented an intelligence that they wanted. Now they're right in the fact that a demon is intelligent. No question about that. But where do you want this intelligence from? There's a price to pay. Some strings attached. If you want this demonic power, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it dearly. And a lot of people sell their souls for prosperity and for fame and fortune. Uh, and when they do that, they, they receive the benefits of it. But then payday comes. And that's the sad thing. What is it? Faustus? Wasn't he the one in one of the old uh, uh, who sold and made a league with the devil and sold his soul? It's been a long time since I read that. I remember when I was a boy, I read a comic or a book about somebody like that, who sold their soul to the devil and for prosperity, fame, and fortune, and then the devil came one day for payday. And that's what happens. He does come for payday. So a demon is not something you want. You don't want a demon. Uh, you don't want a demon. Turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 34 with me and verse number 14. Isaiah 34 and verse 14. All right, now, in Isaiah chapter number 34 and verse 14, the Bible says, And the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satire shall cry to his fellow, The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Now, <laughs> on the surface of it, what you've read here is a place that de describes animals. And... Uh, the animal world is constantly expanding because they're constantly discovering creatures they didn't know existed. And uh, man doesn't know everything. No question about that. But what we have here in Isaiah chapter number 34, in a screech owl, it's translated from the Hebrew word Lilith. Lilith, L-I-L-I-T-H. All you have to do is a Google search on the word Lilith 
and she'll pop up everywhere. She's all over the place. She's in Babylonian literature. She's in Mesopotamia. She's in, uh, in Syrian, Greek, everywhere. Uh, uh, Jewish culture and the Talmud and all that. Lilith is all over the place. The old rabbis used to teach that Lilith was the first wife of Adam. And being the first wife of Adam, therefore she was not taken from Adam's side like Eve. She was created like Adam was. Now where'd they get this? They began to teach that after the Babylonian captivity. In Babylon, when Israel was taken off into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, they picked up a lot of junk, folks. And their theology was greatly affected by it. And this is why you have to make a clear distinction between Old Testament revelation to the Jew and the Talmud and all the rest of the garbage that goes with it. Because the Babylonian Talmud, which is the basis of rabbinic Judaism today, the Babylonian Talmud is based on pagan culture, mythology, and all kinds of, of occult foolishness. It's full of it. And uh, one of the remarkable things about the New Testament, and I've said this to you before, and it's important to remember this. One of the most remarkable things about the New Testament is that you will not find anywhere from Matthew through Revelation any of this pagan, corrupt, cultural, Babylonian uh, influence. It's not in there. It is clear, pure reading of Revelation from God. When the New Testament talks about a demon, it's not talking about it in the sense that the Babylonians talked about it or the sense of the, of the, of the pagan Jews who were affected by this. It speaks of it in the sense of the Bible sense that a demon is a wicked, evil spirit. It doesn't tell you where it came from. Nobody knows where they came from. There's a lot of conjecture about where they came from. You can take it or leave it. However, if you formed an opinion this morning about where demons came from, well, fine, I haven't. And I've been reading it a long time and been studying this thing for a long time about where they came from. And I'm not convinced at all, but they are here. I don't question that for a moment. A demon is an unclean spirit. It's an intelligent spirit. It's something that's been around for a long time. It desires to have a body and it can take your body. It can possess your body. I read you that testimony when I think about Wednesday night or last Sunday, I forget now. I read you the testimony of a, of a man who had had one time been an evangelist and uh, he slipped off into, he fell away from God because of uh, pornography. But the reason he fell away from God because of pornography was because of the problems he had in his life that affected his faith, shook his foundation. But in any event, he wound up, his body was possessed of a demon, not his soul, not his spirit, but his body was. And he's paid a, he's paid a terrible price for it. A demon desires to inhabit you. They are intelligent. They know the Godhead as much as they can know the Godhead. We know who thou art, the Holy One of God. That's what they said to the Lord Jesus. They said to him also, have you come to torment us before our time? They understand that something is coming in the future. They don't know all things. Angels don't know all things. The only one that knows all things is God. And the creature does not know all things. But in any event, a demon is something that you want to leave alone. You want to stay away from it. There's all kinds of avenues that get you into demonic possession, that can get you under demonic influence. You're watching daily on your television set through the news media people that are perpetrating some of the most heinous things in the world by virtue of demonic possession. It's happening all the time. It's everywhere. It's unbelievable at what's going on. Day in and day out, uh, you see this happening in the country and around the world. And it's because that we are literally saturated in this society with demonic possession, oppression, influence, and all that goes with it. So a demon is something that you don't want. So what is Lilith? Why does she show up in the Bible? You notice the King James translators did not translate the word Lilith, which wouldn't have been a translation anyway. It would just simply been a transliteration to take it from Hebrew and put it into English. All what they did was put screech owl in here. Now the revised standard version, the RSV, the RSV, 1889 was the RV. I don't know the RSV. When was it? 1900, 1902, somewhere in there. But anyway, the revised standard version took Lilith and translated it night hag. Now there's a big difference between a night hag and a screech owl, isn't there? Say, so what are you leading to? I'm telling you this. 
I'm telling you that sometimes when the Bible uses a terminology that relates to an animal, there may be a whole lot more going on with that animal than meets the eye. Like a satire, for example. Like this behemoth and like, uh, like these other creatures that you find in Scripture. When the Bible talks about these creatures, it may be implying something here that it takes a little study and comparing Scripture with Scripture to understand what's, what's at issue. Are all animals just animals? Well, there's a lot of people in this country and around the world that for centuries have believed that demons can inhabit animals. They believe they can. Not only that, but they believe that animals sometimes are manifestations of demons. They believe that. Now, uh, there is a considerable amount of evidence right now. And I'm talking about not a, just a few crazed uh, nut jobs that have seen, uh, seen spirits or they have seen UFOs or they have seen this stuff. And, you know, they go off the deep end. Well, anybody can find that. That's everywhere. No, no question about that. There's a lot of people out there that are nothing in the world more than parrots, copycats. But the bottom line is there's an awful lot of very credible people very credible people who have seen this stuff like UFOs, like animals that show up. Like, for example, there are thousands of people around the world that have seen a so-called Bigfoot. All right. They have seen a they have seen the evidence of what is called a chupacabra, a bloodsucker. They have seen the evidence. And this is what's called cryptozoology. How many has ever heard of cryptozoology? A few of you have. Type that into the internet if you want to do a Google search on it. Cryptozoology. And when you put that in there, what you're going to do is pull up all kinds of uh, strange creatures that have for centuries showed up all over the world and all of the stories relating to them. Now, here's a problem. It goes two ways. Way number one, get head over heels into it and get yourself in trouble and start messing around with something you don't need to mess with. Problem number two, bury your hand, head in the sand and act like it doesn't exist. And it's, it's, you know, it doesn't affect you. And you're wrong there too. This nation is full of scientists who have given up on the theory of evolution, who have completely abandoned it. And now they're focusing their attention on extraterrestrials and upon a transperma or where these extraterrestrials came and trans, uh, transplanted Sperma means is from the Greek word spermatozoa, which is a, a seed of life. They have translated life into this world. And so therefore they know that evolution has been debunked. It's a bunch of garbage. They realize that intelligent life had to start what we have here now. They're right on that. The most intelligent life there is is God Almighty. Don't you think he's pretty smart? Hmm? Think God's pretty smart, don't you think? I think he's got an IQ better than 160 or 70, wouldn't you think? <laughs> Certainly he does. So what you know in your existence is the product of supreme intelligence, design. And, and they know that. But they will not allow for God, the creator, to be the one that did it. And the reason they do that is because if they allow for God, the creator, the one be, that did it, then they have to account for the morality, the immoral or amoral. There's a lot of people in this, in this world like that. And they don't want to give an account to God. They don't want to be answerable to Him. But the bottom line is, there's a lot of stuff going on that just simply cannot be categorized, filed away in some lab somewhere, and say, we understand it completely. No, we don't. No, we don't. But I firmly believe this. I believe that what's happening has been happening for a long time and has been as dovetailing now into the great deception that's coming on this earth. And when that deception comes, it's going to blow your mind. It's not something that you're going to be able to sit down and just put on a piece of paper and figure out. The Bible says the very elect will be deceived if possible. And that deception's here. It's already here. It's happening right now, right before your very eyes. Right this moment, it's happening. Now, I'm not a lunatic. I'm not crazy. And, you know, Nixon said, I'm not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really said that. <laughs> he said, I'm not a crook. <laughs> and, uh, and then when he left office, he said, they won't have me to kick around anymore. <laughs> but anyway, 
uh, I'm a Bible believer. And if the Bible does not, if the, if the Bible translates Lilith as screech owl, then that tells me there's something going on here. And it's calling your attention to a certain place. And there's something here. So I'm going to believe the Bible. I believe it, folks. I believe the Bible. Amen. I don't care what anybody has discovered, what revelation they have, or what they've found. If it, try, if it tries to contradict this book, out the door with them. Amen. Just that simple. Say, that's dogmatic. Amen. Yep. That's gun barrel straight. Yes, That's the way it's got to be. The book takes primacy over everything. Right. But anyway, we have, we have all this stuff out here. We have all this stuff today. And what's happening in this country is that people are being saturated and bombarded on a daily basis, 24-7, with a demonic message and a demonic spirit. And it's coming in such a fashion today that it's like a flood. It's like a... It's like a tidal wave, like a tsunami. It's just coming down upon people and they're falling left and right. And the churches are going down. It's unbelievable is what's happening. Now, a demon, therefore, is an intelligent being, a very intelligent being that's been around a long time. Learned mankind by observation, tried and true in their tactics, in what they will use against a human being. You are no match for the intelligence even of a demon, much less Satan. You're no match for them. And so when we're dealing with these creatures, and they are creatures, and they're not almighty, and they don't know everything, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be alert. In 2 Thessalonians 2 it says, And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. I think the greatest, uh, the greatest responsibility incumbent upon us as believers is to ask God to give us the spirit of discernment to show us that delusion. What's its nature? Where does it arise from? Who does it affect? How does it apply to me? When's it coming? Is it already here? All these questions we need to ask ourselves. A strong delusion. So once again, when you go back, when you go back to ghost, you go back to werewolves, you go back to Bigfoot, you go back to shape shifters, you go back to everything that's going on. Little green men that come out of out of UFOs, uh, all of the different, uh, 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 so many that have been taken aboard a UFO. And they've gone through some kind of an inspection and then they come out and then the children that are born to them. All this stuff's going on right now and has been for a long time. And a lot of people just dismiss this as, as, as the ravings of a bunch of lunatics. But I don't. It doesn't mean I believe all of it. But I take it and I compare it with the Bible. And I believe the Bible is warning us that we are right now in the midst, right now, the greatest apostasy the world's ever known. And we're on the precipice of the Antichrist. He's, he's, he's Christ. He's about to step out. This coming Tuesday night, as a matter of fact, Tuesday night when the election results start coming in, and they'll probably come in usually about 8 or 9 o'clock that night, this coming Tuesday night, you will see how far gone this country is. This midterm election, you will see how brainwashed the average American is. And the biggest problem with the average American, he's not only brainwashed, he's ignorant. You know that for years in this country and around the world, you had to pass a test. You had to know so much to be even qualified to vote. Do you know that? I don't know that that's such a bad thing. But of course, what they call that is disenfranchised. But now you've got disenfranchisement on one hand and you've got voter fraud on the other. I don't know how many people, I don't know how many dead people voted for Obama in the last election. I never could figure out how they did that. That's a tough one. But that's going on all the time. You see, you've got that issue. And make no mistake about it, it's, it's already happening. I read a couple of days ago a news article that, that was talking about somewhere where they, when they, pushed, when they pushed the button to vote for a Republican candidate, they voted for a Democrat. And that had already happened before, now it's happened again. Why? See, but anyway, let's get off of that and get back on this. There's something going on, and we need to be aware of it. 
This stuff is not something that was that 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 resides on the late night TV, the talk shows, and the nut jobs. Turn to the book of Isaiah 26 and verse 14. These are two strange Bible words and strange things in Scripture. Isaiah 26, 14. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Now watch carefully. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Now look at that word deceased. Is there really any difference between the word dead and deceased? Not, not necessarily, no. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. So what does deceased mean? It means that they're dead. They've passed on. But do you know what Hebrew word was translated deceased? Right here in Isaiah? It's amazing. Rapha. Rapha. Have you read about the Rephaim? The M.M., the Zanzuman, all those tribes that ended in M. Rapha was connected with the giants. All right. So here in the book of Isaiah, it says that you visited them and you destroyed them and they do not rise. Well, now that makes no sense if you're talking about a human being. For the Bible said in the book of John 5, For all in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. All. They that have done good to the resurrection of life. They that have done evil resurrection of damnation. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice. He said, I am the resurrection of life. So what's going on here? Maybe these aren't human beings. So what are they? Well, if an angel cohabits with a female, a human being, an angel and a human being, the offspring is not going to be a human. It's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a cross between a human being and an angel. Now, I hear people object, and I've, I've seen them write long treatises about how it's impossible for an angel to produce a something like that. Is an angel a spirit being? Is God a spirit being? When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, did a spirit being come upon a human being? A virgin. Did she bring forth a man? She certainly did. <clears throat> so when these angels that kept not their first estate came the daughters of men, Genesis 6, and children were born to them, mighty men of old, sons were born to them. These, these, these Nephilim is what they were called. A Nephilim is a fallen creature. It's neither a man nor an angel. It's a cross between the two. It's a hybrid. So what God do? Here's what he says in Isaiah. He said, I visited them and I destroyed them because they're neither human nor angel. There is no resurrection. They're gone and their memory is to perish. Now that's, that's a strange thing. That's a strange thing. Could we have that today? Is it possible that there could be any of that going on today? Is it possible that a spirit creature could come upon a human being and bring forth a child. That's a weird thought. Yes? Wouldn't it stand to reason if Jesus Christ was born of a Holy Spirit and he was holy from his birth? If something was born from an unholy spirit, would it be unholy? Be unholy. Be unholy. Yes? I know it. Whose would she be in the resurrection? Yes. Yeah. 
Well, he said they neither marry nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of heaven. Uh, but. I know, but when the Spirit did move upon Mary, is of the Holy Ghost. He said that holy thing in her is of the Holy Ghost, and so the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. We're more than just a person, a new person, a new creature. Absolutely. A creature. We and everything else will remain creatures and only one creator. Yes, sir. winged ones show up in Zechariah. <clears throat> the land of Shinar. That's right. <clears throat> yes. Yes. That's exactly. They left it. And they, uh, when by leaving it, why did they leave it? See, I mean, if an angel shows up here, holy angels, and they announced the birth of Christ, and they sang when he, here, they were here, but the angels came from heaven, but they didn't leave their estate. And the Greek word is oikos. That means their house, their abiding place. Something happened to their essence. They had to give up something in order to do this to come down to women. Now here's the thing about marrying or giving in marriage. Uh, we got an awful lot of people today that aren't married or given in marriage, but they're having babies all the time. <laughs> I mean, this, this is going on all the time. What is it now? What's the figure? Well, in some groups, the figure is 80% born out of wedlock. I think the general, the, the general average for the whole nation now is about 60%, 50 to 60, uh, somewhere in there, born out of wedlock. Uh, you know, innocent children. The children are innocent. But, but in any event, uh, this thing about procreation, replenish the earth, is what God said for Adam and Eve to do. And not replenish heaven, but replenish the earth. Yes, sir. All right, turn over here to First Peter. And chapter number four, verse six, and then First Peter five, and uh, somewhere in here I'll find it. First Peter four, uh, six. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are what? Dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Oh, now, that's a very, very mysterious thing. See, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Look over at 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll show you another one that doesn't fit. Everybody makes everything black and white, cut and dried. Categorized, filed away in the right place, easy to understand, but the Bible is the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and I just have to find it. I can't remember exactly where it is, but in here it talks about they're baptized for the dead. 29? All right, thank you. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, you can, get 50, you can get 50 different spins on that. All you've got to do is get your commentaries down, lay them out, and you can spend the next two or three weeks <laughs> trying to put all that together. And it's amazing at how the, that the length that some men will go to to force it into their theology. Where does that belong, preacher? It belongs in the Bible. 
but it belongs in the mind of God. It's one of those things that he hasn't opened up to us completely yet. That's, what I, that's all I do with it. I don't, I don't worry about it. First, uh, First Peter 5. Uh, let's see here. I know the chapter, but I can't remember the verse. Let's see. 1 Peter 5, 4, 3. Here it is. 1 Peter 3. Yeah, 4, yeah, 4, 6, 3. 1 Peter 3 and verse number, uh, verse 19. 1 Peter 3, 19. 1 Peter 3, 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now watch this carefully. Which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited. Now notice how it pinpoints this. In the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing. Wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. Now there you want something that's mysterious. It's that right there. Is there an easy, easy explanation for that? I'm a Bible believer. So what's going on here is something that I can't put together real easily. But I believe it. Something. Will, now here's the common take on this, okay? Here's the common take. I can give you the common take. Common take is when Christ died, he went down into the, into the heart of the earth. He went to the paradise side. Hades is two compartments. Uh, Hades is the unseen state of the dead. Sheol in the Old Testament. Hades in the New Testament. He went down there where it's, you know, the unseen state of the dead, the dark world. And on one side was the rich man in hell. On the other side were the saints that had departed beforehand. The captivity that he led captive. And he announced the victory at the cross at Calvary and preached to them the gospel that Christ had risen from the dead. He was going to rise on the third day from the dead and announce the victory to all the saints of God in that side of Hades. That's about 90% of the time. That's the take you're going to get on that. That's okay, but does that really answer it? Does that answer it for you? <laughs> the bottom line is you've got to live with yourself, and you've got to live with, does that answer it for you? Do, does that answer for me? No. No. I have found that by studying the Bible, so much is just the spin because it's easy to spin, and it fits in with the rest of the spin, it's like the guy that called up, uh, who was it that said it? This, I think it was uh, Copeland. Copeland said it one time. Copeland said, uh, one of the brethren called me up the other day and said, Brother Copeland, what do we believe about this? <laughs> do you really get that? Do you get a hold of that now? <laughs> I don't want to get out of line. I want to make sure whatever I believe is marching to the same tune that all the rest of the brethren believe. Make any difference what I think or I bother to pray over it. Or really understand the text. What do we believe? That's the idea. That's what drives 90% of theology, churches, and the whole nine yards. And if you deviate anywhere from that, then you get in trouble with the brethren. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've showed you three passages this morning that aren't easy to understand. They don't always fit the mold. And so I'll leave them where they belong. What? Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? I believe that. I believe that. And I also believe that if you've got light and you reject light, it becomes lightning. This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There is a vast difference in the way God will judge a prosperity preacher in this country who gets up in that pulpit week after week after week. And my wife told me the other day she listened to... Uh, uh, one of the prosperity preachers that spent some time in prison. And he said years ago, he said years ago, he said, we got this book on prosperity written by a secular writer. You know, how to have become rich. 21 steps to riches. Whatever. We got this book and we laid it down. And we took that book on prosperity and how you can become prosperous. And we laid that book down and we said to ourselves, now why can't we take that? And take the Bible and make the Bible conform to that. And that's what they did. The apostle said, having food and raiment, therewith be content. They would be rich, fall into divers' snares. That's what the Bible says. They constantly use Old Testament saints and their riches, like Job, for example, was a rich man. Abraham was a rich man. They use them 
as examples as the way you ought to be. But the Old Testament saint is altogether different from the New Testament saint. Your Lord and Master did not even have a place to lay his head. You see, but that's a different study altogether. God's blessed you with far more than food and raiment. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm a preacher that believes the Bible. They call us poverty preachers. That's what happens. That's what happens. But let me say this. I would not want to be in their shoes when they stand at the judgment bar of God and give an account for twisting the scriptures to teach that. That one in the bush that has never heard the gospel will stand in an entirely different judgment to that one who has an open Bible in front of him and perverts it week in and week out to match his agenda. The judge of the whole earth will do right. And that gives me great peace because I know men. I know mankind. Amen. I know us. <laughs> he wrote a book and he said, I was wrong about his prosperity. Jim Baker. After I came out of prison, he said, or I don't know if he wrote it in there or out, but he wrote the book and he said, I was wrong. And he was a big prosperity preacher. So, we'll find out, won't we, at the judgment seat of Christ. You go in some churches and all you hear is money from the time you get in there to the time you're gone. Money, 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 money. And I don't have people out there in the world that are so sick and tired of churches that all they talk about is money. You know why? We need big buildings. Why? So we can get a big crowd. Why? So we can build bigger buildings. Why? So we can get a bigger crowd. Why? So we can build bigger buildings. So when we leave, we can brag about leaving $50 million worth of buildings. <laughs> I like the little old country churches myself. Here's 15 signs of the times indicating judgment. Divorce has increased from 4 to 51% in one generation. Cohabitation. 65% of altar-bound singles live together. Abortion. 57 million unborn babies. 50. You need to say that slowly, don't you? 57 million. You know what the population of America is? I don't know exactly. It's a little over 300 million. Does anybody know exactly what it is? Well, who, who can know exactly? But what, 310, 320? What? 310? 310 million people. You know, roughly. So how close is 57 million to that? What percentage of it would it be? Fifth? Five, six, 30? It'd be, be, it would be a little over a fifth. About a fourth. A little, between a fifth and a fourth of the population of this country has been killed off. That's a lot of babies, right? That's exactly right. That's a good point. If they'd only had two apiece, two apiece, you're looking at 120 million right there, plus the 50, so looking at 180 million roughly, that's over half the population of this country. Uh, no, that's a good term too, alien. And you, I mean, it really is. I've got nothing against folks who want to make better their life and come in here and, and, and work and all that, but. Do you realize that the, that, uh, that the word out now is that the President of the United States intends to sign a, uh, a uh, what do you call it? Amnesty. Amnesty. Now, here's the figure. Uh, most of the time, you get the figure of 11 million illegal aliens in this nation. But that figure may be low. I read a thing a couple of days ago, and he said that the figure could easily be over 30 million that's a tenth. One out of ten. Everybody you see walking on the street is an illegal alien. Could be 30 million. And could, who knows? I mean, you know, you don't have them all lined up and let's take account of how many illegals we got in the country. It doesn't work that way. But one said that Barack Obama is directly responsible for this, what is this, enterovirus that these kids are having now? And it's paralyzing many of these children? 
the little children are paying dearly for it, said it came across the border. That when they opened the floodgates and opened the borders and let them flood into the country, here they brought that with them. I, have, I feel for these people. I don't blame them for wanting a better life. I don't blame them one bit for that. I, I understand that. Believe me, I do. But folks, here's, here's the reality of it. This is called pragmatism. When they come into this country, they're bringing all that with them. And all that this nation has done to clean itself up, you know, clean up its health care system and all of that is going to be destroyed within just a few years if you let them flood in on us. And, of course, you know, the, the reason for all of that is to build a Democrat voting base. That's the bottom line. It's all politics. And somebody said that's all it's about. It's all about politics, that they'll all vote Democratic. And so, that, uh, and so what they're doing is flooding the Democrat uh, I, call, I call them Democrats. Yeah. And the Republicans aren't much better. Amen.